Warframe is a game that I hold near and dear to my heart through thick and thin. It's a world that I've engrossed myself and my wallet into for the past seven years or so, to the point where I wouldn't be here making YouTube videos if it wasn't for it. And while the gunplay and gameplay loop carry it for me, the story, characters, and world are what truly engrossed me in the early days. I hadn't really seen a game in its style back then. It's mix of sci-fi with traditional Japanese Bushido ideals, the whatever the hell is going on with these faces. It's something that still hasn't really been emulated to this day. Warframe is still incredibly special to me. In the early days, while Warframe did have story, it was almost exclusively told through context clues and comms dialogue and through the codex, albeit incredibly vague. But it was there for those looking to entrap themselves in a world just asking to be fleshed out. It wasn't until Digital Extreme started pushing their cinematic quest to streamline their story to a more easily digestible form. That first quest being the second dream. Quests up until then were just your standard mission where you go from point A to point B, usually introducing some new mechanic or new game mode before starting you on a farm to get your shiny new Warframe. But with the new strange stuff became a little bit more cryptic. This one and done quest to get the Warframe Chroma seemed to have something a little bit more under the hood, something a little sinister. Tom's talking about this mysterious womb in the sky, the arcane machine defense pod seeming more alien in origin. The shift in tone was strange and hinting towards something. And four months later came the direct follow-up quest, Nata, where you learn, surprise, Lotus is a sentient. Oh yeah, by the way, we're, we're gonna be diving into some spoilers in this video. <laughs> that man mumbling about the womb in the sky? Hunhao, Lotus's deadbeat father, currently living in an undead husk underneath the scenic oceans of my anus. Sab, what the hell is a sentient? What do you mean you didn't scan this one specific synthesis target ten times to read the five paragraphs of some of the most important games? Game lore. Basically, they were terraforming chopsticks sent to the Tau system by the Orokin Empire that essentially fried their ovaries in the process, royally pissing them off and starting a war. You know, it's just your average Saturday with the Orokin Empire. And Hun Hao has a massive hate boner for anything Orokin, including the Tenno. He is out for blood and wants his broken daughter back, which brings us to the second dream. Yeah, it's okay. I know that there are people out here that will defend this quest tooth and nail for the sake of nostalgia and a few key reveals, but the writing inconsistencies, mission structure, and length kind of have me looking back like... Yeah, you were a thing. But that's getting a little bit ahead of myself. I know it was still the early days of Digital Extremes and the writing is nothing what Warframe would eventually turn out to be. And you know what bees make? Honey. Honey gain. I am the king of Segway. Today's sponsor is Honeygain. Do you ever have too much internet? Well, Honeygain uses a small portion of your data and uses it for their web services such as comparing travel and gas prices. Your personal data is safe and you get paid for just having it running on your phone, desktop, air purifier, uh, aquarium. I recently cashed out in crypto amidst the bear market, but you can also pay out using PayPal if you aren't completely insane. You can now buy that Tenogen you've been eyeing. Why wouldn't you want to unleash these cheeks? Signing up with my link in the description will net you a free $5 to start. I'll also be leaving a link to the Honeygain FAQs and answering any questions personally through my Discord if people are interested. Make some of that cheddar through Honeygain. The opening cinematic shows our old pal Stalker taking a break from listening to his discussion disturbed playlist to behead some MR4 Loki. Hun Hao proposes an offer, imbuing himself inside of a sword to aid Stalker, and in return he will fess up the true weakness of the Tano. I am Hun Hao, sentient destroyer of worlds. By your hand, expose their heart. By my age, leave it beating from its nest. God, this clip gives me chills. Hun Hao is such a cornball of a villain later in the story, if I could even call him a villain, but his introduction shows him as a real threat, and it isn't even what we should be afraid of right now. Lotus is aware of Hun Hao trying to jack into her mind and warns the Tenno that he aims to hunt down something called the Reservoir, your supposed weakness that was kept hidden from you all of this time. 
Thanks, Mom. You're sent to Uranus to poke around the Grenier Codexes, scraping together information the Grenier have on Hunhau after excavating his bones within Uranus. Hunhau can apparently jack into the mind of his daughter because she is an extension of him. The same way he can interact with Shadow Stalker through the blade or communicate through his other sentient units. While learning this, you also find an intercepted message specifically for the Lotus. How and why this is in the same data folder as information on Hunhau when only us players are now learning about the Lotus being a sentient, uh, no fucking clue, but it's from this weasel. Hello, Tindall. This really rustles my jimmies. Last we saw Aliv V was during the quest line Patient Zero, where the little rat decided to stick his corpus copulation component into some infestation, creating some mutilist variants and becoming infested in the process. And now he wants to help us and is completely stripped of all of his tendrily bits. What the hell happened? Well, a timed event happened. The Tube Men of Regor. A community-driven event where you had to choose to side with Sergeant Nefanya, who wanted to destroy any chance of a cure to punish Aliv for is complete ineptitude, or side with Alad to cure himself of the infestation by stealing it from Regor's labs. But nowhere is this ever mentioned in the story. Unless you were there or are a desperate wiki diver, you would never know this. But whatever, he's here now. Even in 2022, Sharkwing is about as fun as a sandpaper nutsack exfoliation. Is it a near the dick side? Of course, I could just tell you where it is, but what fun would that be? Oh, go fuck yourself. Alad leads you to some undiscovered bits of Hunhau, and Lotus taps into it to get a better look at what he is seeing. But being a dumb fuck and not realize that she is still a two-way connection, Hunhau taps right back and now knows the exact location of the reservoir. You make your way to Venus to tap into one of the Corpus's still active void gates that Daddy Hunhau is expertly defended by his army of sentient drones. These puppets will not stop me. I will attack in many forms. Impressive. Jumpstarting the portal, you are brought to an uncharted void tower where the massive bombshell is discovered. The moon. It exists. Even though prior to this quest, the moon did exist and it was retconned out of the skybox just for the quest because... Plot. Apparently, Lotus has hidden the entire fucking moon and in extent of the reservoir in the void to keep it safe. Sentience not being able to stand up to the void was the reason for Stalker to be dragged into the situation. So the only logical thing to do is to rip this tower and the moon out of the void, excuse me. It's because apparently Ordis can't pick us up because of the void interference. He has absolutely no trouble any other time, but because we jump through some random gate, yeah, I guess he just doesn't know where we are. I can't tell if Ordis is just a garbage cephalon, or if the writing is bending the rules of the void just for the sake of convenience. I mean, Ortis literally uses the void to surround the orbiter for stealth, and his comms are perfectly fine, so I don't know what the deal is here. Keep talking, Oricon called Alad V. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's shittiest and most pointless exposition drop. On the moon, Stalker has already initiated a security precaution to destabilize Lua to cause it to collapse because that's just apparently a thing that the Orokin decided to install on celestial bodies a couple thousand years ago. Restabilizing an entire moon just takes a couple hundred shields, though. <laughs> And then we have this boss sentinel that you need to shut up, which is as simple as baiting him to shoot his own pillars, but I swear, half of the time he doesn't even want to teleport to the other side to shoot them. And sometimes his shots just clip through the damn walls anyway. I remember this fight functioning fine on release, which is something I can't really say about modern DE, but d damn, this thing needs some fine tuning in modern day because it's broken as shit. With the moon stabilized and returned to Earth's orbit, you actually get your first real glimpse to the past, your previous mother figure, Margulis, arguing with her lover, Ballas, a figure that you'll come to know later. Margulis, wanting to heal the Tenno from a failed void jump, was sentenced to death by the Orokin. All of this stuff, once again, from previous Codex entries, such as Ember Prime, finally being streamlined into the plot. Making your way to the center of the moon, you find yourself in the womb of the sky, bringing us to the cutscene that most of us still remember six years later. Dream. Not of what you are. But of what you want to be.
During the old war, Lotus Ort Nata was tasked with killing you by her father, but over time became soft, taking the physical form of the late Margulis and becoming your mother figure, ultimately saving you by taking your void-ridden body and putting it into a lucid second dream, allowing you to control surrogate bodies, the Warframes to channel your inner strength. Stalker comes to crash the party like it's Wave 4 of Hydron, only to be reminded of his own mortality, sparing the Tenno for now. You carry your sack of void potatoes to extraction, using the power of hand lasers to take down Hunhouse sentient fragments. Too bad it means literally nothing because you are unkillable anyways. God, no wonder you guys lost the war. This this, this is not my ship. This is not my ship. Stalker decided to turn 360 degrees and walk away for one last showdown, but nothing a few hand lasers can't fix. This sudden flip is never really explained. Like, was it Hun Hao controlling him? <laughs> eh, I don't think so. Probably as Hun Hao starts begging for protection. Protection from what, you may ask? Ah, deus ex machina, that's what. I sure hope it doesn't take four years to answer what the hell just happened. Lotus walks through your front door because apparently everyone has access to my keys and places the baby back in its crib, rewarding you with the world's longest time between account creation to create your Tenno. And that was the second dream. A lot of people seem to fondly remember the cinematic portions, the, the cutscenes with Stalker and finding the reservoir, but really seem to overlook some of the useless exposition dumps and the overall incredibly confusing character motivations, but just growing pains in the grand scheme of things as Digital Extremes does get much better with the writing later on. Spoiler alert, the sacrifice is the best quest ever. Do not at me. And I, I guess we're gonna get there at some point. Okay, bye.